Good morning. My name is Joe Beatty. I'm research supervisor for the North Carolina Office of Archives and History. And uh, you're joining us today for Flyleaf, an occasional conversation we have with, uh, with folks about uh, research and publications and the things that, uh, that we do here in the Historical Research and Publications Office uh, for the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. I'm really glad today to, to uh, talk with Drew Gruber, Executive Director of the Civil War Trails. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the history and operation of the Trails program and, and, um, and its relationship with, uh, with education and outreach that uh, the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources does. Um, you know, our office here in, in the Office of Archives and History does publishing and research in support of education about historical events in the state. So many folks are probably familiar with the Highway Historical Marker program that our office does, the familiar silver signs with black text that you see around the state. We put those up to mark the locations of, uh, of places of statewide historical significance. And um, over the years, we've worked with Civil War Trails and uh, in supporting the research and, and uh, we certainly like the, the work that they do. So um, Drew, can you uh, give us a brief introduction and, uh, and we'll, we'll start talking. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for having me, Joe. It's, it's a pleasure to be here and to give us an audience. Um, I can give you a little history on how the Civil War Trails program began, uh, if that's helpful to get us moving. Mm -hmm. Um, so several people take credit for the idea of Civil War Trails, uh, and, and they like to sort of banter back and forth about who was there at the table one day. But as it's been relayed to me by all of the interested parties, um, sometime around 1994, we think maybe fueled with some beer or bourbon, a group of historians in Richmond were thinking about a way to allow people to follow Robert E. Lee's retreat from Petersburg and Ap uh, from Petersburg and Richmond to Appomattox. And that was sort of the genesis of our program. So they stitched together about 12 sites that you could follow in your car. And as you drove along, you would see these massive billboards on the side of these very rural roads that gave you uh, an AM radio station to tune into. And you would pull your car up into this little uh, parking lot and tune your radio station. And then uh, Chris Calkins, who's a ranger, at Sailors Creek Battlefield and previously at Petersburg National Battlefield Park, his voice would come on your radio and he would narrate what happened to you right then and there. And that was sort of the genesis of our program. So in 1994, there were 12 sites. And as I speak to you all today, uh, we're just at about 1,350, maybe a little north of that and uh, moving into our sixth state. Um, so the program has been, been around for, for quite some time. Um, and if you're into superlatives, I would say that with just about 200,000 square miles of curated experience to see, we would be the world's largest open air museum. Very cool. Um, that's a lot of sites. You've got more than 1,300 places uh, scattered across, what do you say, six states? Yeah, we're moving into Pennsylvania now. All right. Um, so what are the challenges around uh, choosing where to locate one of these markers? The hardest part is always finding the right sites. Um, so we have people who will approach us with their stories. So my team doesn't normally go out looking for, for new sites or stories to tell. Usually they come to us, which is exciting. We'll have somebody who will send us a tweet or a Facebook message or hit us up on our website and they'll say, hey, we got this great story in our community, whether that be an underground railroad story, a story of a training camp or a battle or skirmish site. And then they'll process that application form for us. But usually the hardest part of that process is being able to marry that context of that story with the landscape and getting the property owner permission. That's, that really for us tends to be the hardest part because the last thing we want to do is put someone where the event didn't take place. So as we often say, we want you to stand in the footsteps of history and, and that's what we're after. So the hardest part of this program, at least when it comes to erecting new signs is being able to find the correct site and know exactly where you are. And this is both mechanical, so trying to get that property owner permission, but also from a research perspective, because a lot of these smaller engagements, a lot of these smaller camps, there are a dearth of primary source records. So oftentimes we're relying on archaeology or even amateur archaeology to tell us where these events took place. And it is a broad interpretation of where those events took place. And we'll create a conjectural map of what we think happened there. And yeah, that's the hardest part is really tends to be finding 
finding that historic site and placing your feet there and then getting property owner permission to, to put a sign there. So that tends to be the hardest thing. After the ribbons cut and we've walked away, uh, really the hard work begins. Maintaining these signs also means updating the content to keep pace with scholarship. Um, oftentimes our signs or for example, state highway signs have been the only public interpretation of these events. And that'll fuel people to want to research more and then they share that with us. So the maintenance of the program is, is something that takes the lion's share of my time. But when it comes to installing the signs, the hardest part is finding that contextual location. Yeah, that makes sense. You, you want to be in the place, but you want to make sure you're in the right place. <laughs> and we get fussed at sometimes. People will write us and say, oh, you know, I was researching this battle of Big Creek and it turns out your sign is 200 yards north in the wrong location. And, and the good news is we have the ability to move it if we can find a property owner. So that's, that's always the hardest thing. That's great. It's, it's great that you have the flexibility to, to make changes and to continue to update what you're doing. For for folks who may not be familiar with the um, with your trails signage, can you describe to us what uh, what one of these looks like if somebody's driving along what, and they stop? What are they going to see? A great question. I always fail to mention when I say a Civil War trails site with thirteen hundred and fifty of them. When I say a site, what I mean is an interpretive sign: two legs, brown sign, and when you go up to read it, it'll have a blue banner with a Civil War trails logo and about 200 or 250 words. Every time you arrive at a Civil War Trails site, you're gonna see one of these consistently branded, shaped and sized signs for you to read. We also have a bunch of signs that are littering the roads throughout North Carolina to get you to those sites. And of course we have brochures to help you get there as well. But yeah, when I'm talking about a Civil War Trails site, what I'm referring to is that dual leg sign that you go up and you read at each site, which is supposed to sort of make that landscape come alive. It should be your caption for that landscape, it should fuel your imagination. That's really cool. Yeah, and, and they're in, you know, unlike, um, unlike our state highway historical marker signs that are way up on poles and, you know, we have 130 characters to use. These are accessible, full color. You can walk up to them, they're wheelchair accessible, right? Sometimes, uh, although I will say we did just install a sign on an island in the middle of the Potomac River. Um, so you have to be creative to get there. Uh, and I suspect that this will be the first of many signs like that. Um, we're working actively to move some of our signs, which talk about the Underground Railroad, to kayak put-ins. So you will be able to literally paddle these avenues of self-determination and emancipation, which is great. Um, we have a lot of signs, especially in the western part of the state, that are along trailheads. So you have to have a good pair of knees and hiking shoes to get to them. But by and large, we try to make them as accessible as possible. Um, but back to your previous question about the hard part, which is finding that historic, that context, marrying where we want to tell the story with that accessibility. The last thing I want to do is put you somewhere where it says three miles north of here. Uh, I want you to be able to stand in those footsteps. So sometimes that means getting in a kayak or taking a hike. Hey, that's good. So, always an adventure with us, I'll tell you. <laughs> well, I can only imagine uh, you guys having to haul one up uh, with it on a kayak or, or haul one up a, a trailhead somewhere uh, to install it. So uh, yeah, it's an yeah. adventure all around. We've had some embarrassing installation trips. Um, the one on the island, uh, we checked and double checked all of our tools and materials before we got on the boat to go out there. And when we unpackaged everything, we realized that the sign had been improperly constructed. No. So we couldn't just hop back in the boat. So we got creative. Um, we also did an installation on a mountain one day where uh, we were, literally carrying the 80 pound bags of concrete up the hill until we realized the gate for the truck was unlocked. So we, I mean, you know, <laughs> it's always an adventure, <laughs> but this is, this is what we do for you folks. So you have a great experience when you travel civil war trails. This is the commitment we have to offer. That's great. Um, so you said you have like 250 words or so on a, on a panel. I, you have limited space. How do you choose what to include? Ooh, that's a tough one. Easy questions. Um, yeah. So we do not, we do not write the content of our signs. Um, we pride ourselves in being able to take the content that the communities give to us and just simply package it within our style guide. Um, so we oftentimes will work with community leaders, descendant groups, um, heritage organizations, round tables, the people who are going to bring these stories to us 
are going to be the same folks who are going to give us that direction with the content. Um, so by and large, uh, as I often like to say, this is sort of grown at the grassroots, it's sort of crowdsourced public history, if you would. And um, the only time we'll really get involved is if the, the proposed wording is either way too long or tries to fit everything in. Um, and we'll try to boil it back down to those 200 or 250 words. I don't know if we could do what you guys do on 130. That's, that's kind of tough. But, you know, our goal is to not do a data dump, right? Our goal is to sort of be, as I said before, that caption for the landscape. So we want to provide just enough information that fuels the imagination for the visitor standing there. And that may be sort of your stereotypical heritage tourist the wife or daughter, just a stereotype, who's stuck in the car with that heritage tourist, uh, or our accidental traveler, or travelers who will see us as they travel, you know, byways for barbecue or beer. So we need to be able to write these signs so they're accessible to everyone. That typically means making tough decisions about how much content we put on that sign. Because what we really want to do, again, is inspire and get people to sort of leave that sign with some type of visceral, you know, uh, reaction to it. We want, not that I want people to leave angry, but we want them to be sort of inspired by that content to look up some other things. So whether that be telling the story of a battle through the lens of a soldier, as opposed to doing a listicle of the battle, you know, that's, that's, that's sort of the conversation that is one of the more difficult ones when we're working with the stakeholder group is to determine how much of that story we want to tell. But traditionally, a lot of times when it came to battle narratives, there would be sort of a text that third battalion, this regiment would march by this way. And you could put all that on a map, right? So that sort of takes that out and makes, opens that text back up for you. But that's also why we design our signs to be easily amended and updated. Because I think history is cool. Obviously the stakeholders are bringing that story to us, but our average visitor may not have that same lens. So we design our signs and we fabricate our signs in a way that allows us to update that content. So if we put a sign out there about the Battle of Wise's four. accurate interpretation that will ever be and we can edit it to make sure that we're updating that content oh i'm sorry Are we back yeah, up again Jeff? for a second but you're good apologies um so yeah figuring out where to cut that content is the hardest place is the hardest thing for us to do to make sure that it's you know exciting but we also have the mechanisms to update those signs to ensure that we are able to keep that content relevant to everybody and update as research goes on so we we specifically design them and archive them in a way that allows us to update them. So we're not stuck. That's terrific. Yeah, that's always, you know, history is always changing and it's, uh, it's challenging to be able to keep things uh, fresh and up to date. Yeah, and we'll, we'll have people reach out to us after a sign goes in the ground and they'll say, man, you, you know, your sign inspired me. Here's the diary from my ancestor who was there or here's a daguerreotype of them or, you know, we did archaeology out there and here's what we found. And that allows us to keep pace with that changing scholarship. Yeah, that's excellent. And it's great that you're providing a venue for people to, you know, a lot of times people hold things like this, then they don't know where to, who to communicate with, how to share them. And, and it's great that you're finding a, an outlet for that stuff. So it, it strikes me that this is, um, you know, an unusual form of public history engagement and education, you know, like we're accustomed to writing books or, or, you know, uh, we put articles on uh, the website here, or we, uh, you know, we give public lectures, but uh, putting a sign in the ground, a, a tangible physical thing is, is a little uh, different, but clearly people use these and enjoy them. Um, what do you see as the, the benefits or the opportunities of doing um, doing trails like you've been, uh, been? Well, I mean, one of the big benefits um, and most tangible, and I think germane to where we are right now is the fact that these are amenities that are outside. So we saw a, a pretty wide response to civil war trails throughout the restrictions of COVID, whether that be parents who were thrust into the role of homeschool teachers who just needed to do something not on front of the computer and get their kids outside, we, we could answer that for them. Um, you know, for communities who have always had these stories that were, you know, lesser known or not in academic books, um, we can provide that audience for them. Um, 
And because we have this mechanism to update them, it also means that these things are always assets, not only for the community, um, but also for, for travelers. So there's that sort of other component of this, which is our primary mission outside of place-based education, which is to drive economic development. So as I often say, I mean, we are an educational product with an economic development mission because when you hop in the car to go to Kinston to visit the Civil War trail signs, I hope you stop at Mother Earth Brewing and I hope you also get some barbecue. And when you frequent those businesses, you're putting money back into the hands of the service industry. So there's this other sort of flip side of this of this program of not just being educational or a tool that is always updated, but it it's a boon for the local communities. And because we're grown at the grassroots and the content of these signs comes from the communities, it means that they're also our best brand ambassadors. So if you go from Kinston up to Hampton, Virginia, you're going to be consuming Hampton, Virginia's stories that are germane to them and their neighborhoods, right? So, and as people from Hampton who wrote their signs go out and visit Richmond or Baltimore, they're also consuming the same thing. So it's, it's a really humbling program to be part of because of the way that it's structured, because of the way that it's organized. So uh, it's been amazing to, to sort of serve communities in, in a varying degree of, of sort of facets, if you were. Um, it's, it's rather humbling. Yeah, the grassroots nature of this is really cool. And I like the idea that... Um, it's getting people off the interstates, you know, and, and getting folks into, into local communities. It, there's uh, so much to see off the highway and it's, uh, it's nice to have an excuse uh, to have a destination in mind when you, uh, when you decide to take the exit off of I-95. It is, I mean, there's sort of that sort of vintage vibe to it and the old school road trip is definitely back again, especially with COVID. Um, but it's not uncommon for people to write us and say, hey, you know, we're going to take this route as opposed to this interstate. Is there a place we could run the kids? Is there a place that's safe to picnic? And they, they view us as being that amenity. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. There's always something new. Visitors always tell me a totally different approach to using this program that I just cannot conceive. So. That's great. Um, you've talked about the grassroots you know, uh, application and, and organization of this, how does someone apply for um, one of these markers? It, it's, it's really easy. You can hop over to our website, which is civilwartrails.org and click the membership tab. Uh, or like most people who don't want to use the membership tag, they'll send us a tweet or a Facebook message and say, oh, I got this great story in my backyard, or, you know, we'd really like to do this, or our historical society or church would like to do that. And it just starts an organic conversation with us about you know, what asset you have, what store you have, and then we start talking about it. Um, so there's a really a couple things that happen when you approach us about adding your site to a Civil War Trails, uh, to one of the Civil War Trails maps or to the program as a whole. Um, there are some costs involved with it. So uh, it's not a free program. A lot of people think we're a National Park Service program or a state program. We are a nonprofit. Um, so like any good nonprofit, we tend to run in the red. Uh, but there are some costs associated with it. So if you want to join the Civil War Trails, you're going to write us with whatever method you'd like, um, tweet us, call us, email us, and uh, propose your story, and also propose the site that you would like to tell that story at. Um, the initial cost to add a site to the Civil War Trails program uh, is around about $2,600 um, at the moment, and that that gives us the money that we need to help you design your sign, to help you fabricate your sign, to install the sign that you read in the ground, then to coordinate all the directional signs to get people there and to put you on the map guide. So that's sort of the first cost associated with this program. But the two biggest hurdles, like I've mentioned before, that we need to get through is being able to marry that historic context with that site. So making sure that we have picked out a site um, that lends itself to telling the story that, that you want to tell. And then we start working with some of the municipal offices to make sure that we can sustain that. So there is a sustaining fee for Civil War Trails. And that's what allows us to have the ability to update the signs or to maintain them or to market them. Um, so the process is kind of straightforward. We do get a lot of applications. Um, some of them we turn down as being part of the Civil War Trails program. They sometimes will manifest better as a local sign initiative, maybe something branded to a local historical society. Um, sometimes we'll get applications for stuff and once they realize we're going to 
tell the world about their site. They get a little shy about having people show up at all hours of the day. Um, and we'd like, to, we'd like to nip that in the bud before we get the sign in the ground. Um, but it's a pretty straightforward process. We, um, we're, not, we're not hard to work with uh, at all, really. We don't decline a lot of applications, let's just say. And, um, and you described about that, uh, the application fee, is that primarily how the program's funded or? Um... Yeah, so we, we have two main sources of funding, the initial cost for us to design, fabricate and install the set of signs and put you guys on the maps. And then that annual sustaining fee. So if you drive around and you see a sign that's in bad shape, tell us about it. Um, but those signs all have a sustaining member uh, who pays $200 annually for us. And that's what allows us to maintain them if they get clobbered by a snowplow or update the content if you send us a cool new map. It also allows us to design the brochures and everything like that. So there's those two main funding sources. Um, not to sort of muddy the waters, but we, we also get involved in other signage projects. We just got asked to write a sign about barbecue for somebody in New Bern. Uh, which is interesting. Um, we're working on some Revolutionary War projects. We just wrapped up the Civil Rights Project in Virginia. So we occasionally dabble in other eras, which is a nice way to offset our budget and buy new tires for the truck or a new pair of overalls for the team or new boots or new tools. Um, but yeah, we, we run pretty lean. That's cool. Um, now you said before, I thought you had five states and now you're saying six states. So how do you, uh, how do you manage that? And, and, you know, just in full disclosure, we have the North Carolina Highway Historical Marker Program has 1,619 markers just in our state. And that, you know, that's a lot of territory to cover. How do you manage uh, such a far flung project? I was going to say poorly, um, <laughs> but no, <laughs> it, 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 um, it takes a village, uh, literally, in, in some instances. So we're, we're, we're reliant on visitors and community members to let us know when the signs fall into disrepair or if they need to be updated. And then myself and Chris, so who's the only other full-time staff, we have two full-time staff to oversee all six states. Um, myself and Chris, will, we will organize maintenance trips around what people are reporting to us. Um, so you all out there, you are eyes and ears. Keep us posted. Um, we handle all of the writing and the development. So the letters go out to the membership each year. And we hope that the members are looking at their signs and also telling us if they're in good shape. And this is just maintenance. We're not even talking about marketing and making sure people know about us. Um, it is more than a full-time job, like most nonprofits. So I don't think we just work 40 hours a week. Um, but yeah, there are two full-time staff members. We do have a part-time historian and editor who works with us, and he helps those stakeholders and community groups hone that language. And then we have a, a contractor, Jason, who works with us. In fact, he's been with the program the longest since 1996. So when we spend a week and we do a whole drive through North Carolina, Jason's going to come with us and he's going to help us fix and maintain signs. So we try to be as efficient as possible. Um, the other thing I should say too, is that since the signs are built in a way that makes them easy to maintain, if we're really in a bind, like if the team's in Memphis and somebody from Wilmington's got an issue with their sign, if need be, we can mail you a panel or instructions on how to fix it. So uh, we tend to often enlist our, our friends in each community um, and you know they, they're willing to help. So it takes a village, Joe, to get all this done. Um, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I wish we could have some more staff though. <laughs> Yeah, might, might make things a, a little easier, it sounds. Um, well, that's great that, that you really have a, uh, I didn't realize how really locally driven your program was. Um, and that's really cool uh, to, to get folks engaged in their local history and telling these stories and, and keeping these stories uh, fresh and keeping them, you know, even down to just making sure that the sign is still on the post and hasn't been hit, like you say, hasn't been hit by a snow plow or something. That's uh, lawn mowers are are our prime peril um, around here. But uh, you have to be uh, going kind of fast on a lawnmower to knock over a sign, though. I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> one never knows how this happens. Yeah, in, in Western North Carolina, it's the snow plows. Um, in Central North Carolina, it's the retirees. And in Coastal Carolina, and I mean that, yeah, truly. And in Coastal Carolina, it's the uh, the hurricanes. So those 
those are our three um, biggest detractors with maintenance in North Carolina. Sure. Uh, but again, it, we're, we're reliant on everybody who's tuning in to be engaged with the program. It's, it is grassroots driven. It's sort of crowdsourced. So. Yeah, that's cool. And, and, and I remember the, the, I think the first time I became aware of your, your small um, directional signage pointing towards something. And, and it's like, wait a second, I followed it off the road and I'm like, Hey, this is pretty cool. You know, it pointing at stories that I, I hadn't heard, you know, things I wasn't aware of. I love the, uh, as you pointed out before, it's great that you get to stand in these places. Um, you know, location is, is so important. And as, you know, as we discussed a little bit earlier, uh, especially now when it's so important both to be outdoors um, and it's important to get away from the computer. It's great to, to find some new place to, to go visit. Yeah. I, you know, I often wonder with everything going on right now with COVID um, you know, and everything being so zoom oriented, if people are going to need a really nice digital detox once everything opens up and returns back to normal and, and we're happy to be there for them at that time too. So, I mean, order a brochure from us, try navigating to a site without your smartphone, take a good old fashioned road trip, pack a picnic. It'll be fun. That sounds good. Um, if somebody wanted to do that, which I hope everybody does, um, you know, this, this may be a challenging question, but, uh, you know, where would you recommend that someone go? Do you have any particular, like, um, little known stories in North Carolina? Are there any specific, you know, I don't want to pin you down to name your favorite, but are there, you know, what, share with us a story or two from North Carolina that you think is, uh, it's a good excuse to, to get outside. Well, I will say I haven't seen every single sign yet. And I don't, I don't have a sort of a mental snapshot of every single one, but there, there are some, there are some sites that stick with me. Um, there's one site in Avery County that, that talks about uh, either Confederate soldiers who had deserted or unionists using these series of bushes and brambles to hide in. And every time I stand at this historic site in Avery County, I just look at the set of bushes and brambles that are in front of me. And I just sort of envision these people hiding out here as the Confederate home guard rides by them. And, and those are the type of reactions we want people to have. But there's, there's two stories in particular, I will say, um, that have stuck with me in North Carolina. One is in Camden County at the, um, at the South Mills Lock, uh, which you can still pilot today in your boat. Um, and it recounts the story of two Confederate boats from the Mosquito Fleet escaping action with the Union Navy there. And one of the boats is three inches too wide to pass through the lock. And they have this moment where they kind of have to slam on the brakes and back the boat off as they go, you know, steaming to an escape. Um, and it's hard not to read that sign and look up at the lock, seeing a modern boat and just get this sort of moment where you almost wonder if the guy on the bow was turning around to the captain, he's like, stop, stop. And, it, and you know, it's, it's really hard not to sort of um, put yourself in that place in that moment. And then another one is from the polar opposite side of the state. Um, it's up near uh, Asheville in Buncombe County. And it's about this farmer, um, Riley Powers, who uh, joins his local infantry regiment, a farmer from the mountains, and when within a few months time, he gets placed on what will become the CSS Virginia. So the most advanced battleship that the planet has ever seen. And here's this guy from the mountains of North Carolina who'd probably never really stumbled into too much other than a creek before in his life. And now he's on the Chesapeake Bay in this massive battleship. But these, I mean, these are the types of stories that you'll find. We have amazing stories across the entirety of North Carolina. I think we have 225 or 230 sites in North Carolina. And I mean, they just cover this wide breadth of your narrative from the Okanichi tribe to the USCT soldiers at Forks Road and everything in between. It's, it's just incredibly diverse. And I, I think it, it bodes well, especially in this time and place to, to sort of drive and look at these stories because they are incredibly diverse. Uh, it is certainly not a, a homogenized narrative by any means. Um, so anyhow, I went too far afield with that answer for you. But yeah, I have some favorite stories in North Carolina. Um, oh, that's great. Gotland County has some really cool sites um, that, you know, if you really feel like taking a drive south of Fayetteville, Scotland County, North Carolina has some interesting sites. Um, one is located next to a temperance hall, which is kind of an interesting site to to go visit. Um, you can certainly drive the Carolinas campaign. If you're into battle narratives, um, Wise Fork is one of my favorite battlefields and very few people know about it. 
Um, and then of course you have, you know, some standards, which are always worth revisiting like Aversboro or, or Bentonville. Um, but really these things are in your backyard. You can use our interactive map on our website, which is SavoreTrails.org and click on the interactive map to find the one that's closest to you or request a brochure. I'll mail it right to your house. And if you want suggestions on where the best beer and barbecue is in between, we got those too. That sounds good. I like this plan. <laughs> It's a good time. I get distracted when we're out working. <laughs> it sounds like it could be easy. Yeah. Um, let me know if you need help, you know, digging post holes or something. I, I, I'll volunteer. Oh, we, we take up those offers pretty frequently. So don't say that lightly. Okay. Um, what do you see as the future of the Civil War Trails program? Oh, man. <clears throat> I guess I could sort of answer that in two ways geographically i'd love to invade kentucky did i use the word invade um i'd love to annex kentucky no i'd love to see kentucky join our program um because a lot of the sites that we have in western west virginia and in the northern section of tennessee talk about kentucky um and there's a really nice harmony between those narratives and um you know, I, I love bourbon. It would be a good excuse to visit Kentucky for battlefields and bourbon. But um, <clears throat> all joking aside, I would love to see us expand in Kentucky. I would love to see us continue sort of this expansion into Pennsylvania. And certainly not just around the Gettysburg narrative. You got amazing sites about um, industry and industrial workers and immigrants in places like Pittsburgh uh, and Philadelphia. You have incredible stories about the Underground Railroad sort of laced all around the Susquehanna River area. Uh, and then, of course, we have, you know, the eastern shore of Maryland and Virginia, which is, um, I won't say largely untouched with Civil War sites. We have about a half dozen or a dozen out there. Um, but the narrative along the Delmarva Peninsula, Virginia, Maryland, and into Delaware is laced with these incredible stories of, of espionage and of agency and emancipation. Of course, people tend to know Tubman and they tend to know Douglas. Um, but they don't know about all the other Underground Railroad operators who are out there or about the houses or families that were literally split into two over this issue and the various regiments raised and the USCT soldiers. So, I mean, when I think about the expansion of the program geographically, I tend to think about Pennsylvania, Delaware, and, and sort of Kentucky as being sort of the logical fits for sort of the space and stories that we tell now. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, my board is also interested in helping communities tell other stories. So there are revolutionary war narratives and how to stitch those together. Or there are civil rights narratives. And just like we try to blur municipal lines for visitors. So when they follow the Gettysburg campaign, they can go from Fairfax, Virginia to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and not realize they're crossing through multiple states. I think a lot of our visitors don't necessarily see a hard start or stop to the Civil War era. I think when they think about um, underground railroad operations in northeastern North Carolina in the 1830s and 40s, a lot of visitors view that as being part of the Civil War narrative. Mm -hmm. And when they view the suffrage movement and into early civil rights, a lot of our visitors view that as an extension of the Civil War narrative. So I think for us, expanding geographically is great, but also thinking about how large our narrative really is uh, and being able to offer an expansion of those stories on various other signs to make our open air museum larger, more diverse and fuller. That's, that's kind of where I see us going. I know that was an amorphous answer. No, that, I mean, that, uh, no, that helps. Cause it seems like you have a, it seems like you have a product and you also have a process here to, um, that can be extended to things like the Revolutionary War that can be extended, you know, uh, later in time. Um, and that's cool. You've obviously got a model for, for gathering community interest and sharing history and, and, uh, and getting those words, getting that word out. Places and, and learn and see cool things. Um, you mentioned about like expanding into Kentucky. I do I am I correct in assuming that there's some relationship between your program and the state level? Like, uh, how how does that work? 
Yeah. And that's, so, so that's one of the things that we're working out with Pennsylvania right now. So <clears throat> being crowdsourced content, it's the communities who come to us, whether, again, so whether that be local religious leaders or descendant groups or heritage societies or historical societies, those people are going to provide the content to us. And then they typically foot that initial fee. And then the maintenance and marketing of these usually falls on, say, a municipal tourism office. Because, again, we have that, that other product, right, or that other goal, which is to bring people in to, to spend some money. Um, so we have that sort of municipal level. And then, of course, you mentioned before these directional signs, which are typically installed by us along the state highways. So we have a relationship with state highways. And then we design the brochures, but the state travel offices prints those. So it, again, it takes this, this multiple levels of this village to make this whole program work. So if we were to expand fully into Pennsylvania or into Kentucky, it starts with the stakeholders creating the content, but then we're also going to need the regional destination marketers to help us. And then we're going to need the state travel office and the state DOT office to make sure that people know those sites are there. Because, I mean, what good's a sign if nobody knows it's there? Oh, that's right. You might stumble across it, but, you know, for it to be effective for public history or economic development, people need to know it's there. So, yeah, it takes all levels. So um, although we are a nonprofit, I report to a board of, I think, 26 now and maybe 27 next week. I have a lot of bosses and uh, they they tend to be the state travel officers or their appointees and then all of these um, regional destination marketers. Um, so yeah, we definitely need the state's participation because we want the state to view this as as worthwhile for education and as worthwhile for economic development. So it takes a lot of coordination and it takes a lot of effort. Um, but again, because it's sort of crowdsourced, it all it all hums along pretty seamlessly. Some days, knock on wood. There's only two of you, right? Yeah. <laughs> I hope you get some time off. Um, uh, what can people do to help the program? Awesome question. Um, if you if you leave this conversation with nothing else, don't be a stranger. Uh, let us know if you find a directional sign and you swing a right off the highway and, and you you don't end up at a Civil War Trail site. Please let me know. It would be good to know if the directional sign sent you far afield. Um, if you get to a sign and it's in terrible shape, or you read it and it's boring, or leaves you with more questions than we answered, please let me know. Um, again, you're the eyes and ears of our program, um, being you, not just you, Joe, but everybody else who's listening today. Um, so we, we need you all involved. Um, these, these are your signs, they're in your communities, they talk about your ancestors, they relay your local stories, so they're, you're, they're yours, we serve you, let us know what we can do better. Um, and, it, and again, if you're a visitor traveling and the brochure wasn't detailed enough for the trailblazers sort of left you hanging randomly, um, let, us, let us know. If you have new stories to tell, whether they be edits to the signs themselves or just new stories that haven't been marked, reach out to us. Um, we'd love to hear from you. As, as you've heard, this is our lifeblood. We, we thrive on this crowdsource history. So, so don't be a stranger. If you're a super uber nerd and you're doing research and our sign just missed the mark, Work with us. We'll edit it. That's good to know. Um, well, you know, I know we've had in this office. We've enjoyed working with with you guys over the years, and in, in uh, reviewing content, and you know, pointing out sources, and, and doing what we can to to help you all. Um, and it, it's always a pleasure working with you guys. And uh, it's nice to get to talk with you today. Um, do you have any last thoughts or things you want to share? Or do you have any questions for me? Maybe I should ask that. I don't think I have any questions for you, but I, I will say, um, you know, your office and the rest of the team there um, has been extremely helpful. There will be some times where we'll have questions put, put forward to us either by the community or by our team. We just can't answer. And, and you guys come in like the, the champions you are and just knock these questions out of the park. So thank you. Um, again, you're, you're part of this village that it takes to keep this system alive and well. Well, we're, we're glad to do it. We're always, uh, we're always interested in getting good information out to people. And especially if we can do that in a way that services, education and economic development, we're, uh, we, we stand ready to assist. Um, well, Drew, it was great talking with you today. Likewise, this was a ton of fun. Thanks for having me. Um, I look forward to seeing you, hopefully in person sometime, uh, sometime soon. Be well, Joe. Thanks so much. Right. Take care.
Thank you.